Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to Chatham House for this panel discussion uh, tonight on resisting Russian information warfare lessons from Ukraine. Um, I'm Joyce Hackney. I'm the Deputy Director of the International Security Program here at Chatham House and the co-editor of the Journal of Cyber Policy. The cyber element to the war uh, on Ukraine has been arguably one of the most uh, interesting case studies on the role that cyber can play in, in conflict. At the beginning of Russia's war on Ukraine, many expected that cyber will play um, a very big role and that we will witness several cyber attacks that will have devastating consequences on not only uh, Ukraine's capacity to defend itself, but also will have a spillover impact on potentially, you know, uh, uh, Western allies. Um, what we have seen, however, is quite an impressive resilience on the Ukrainian front against uh, uh, the cyber attacks, but also uh, against information uh, uh, campaigns and, and influence campaigns more generally. And basically, this was due in part or in large parts to the public-private partnerships that we have seen, to the big role that civil society and citizens uh, have played, to an international support uh, uh, that the Ukrainians have received, but also, importantly, due to thorough preparation and anticipation of some of those threats. In a year that is increasingly being known as the year of elections, a very important question we want to ask and answer uh, tonight, how can other countries uh, who are, you know, going through those sort of democratic uh, processes and elections, how can they learn from uh, the Ukrainian experience and better prepare themselves against uh, influence campaigns, whether these are from uh, uh, Russian actors or others. And to do that, we have a fantastic uh, panel with us uh, tonight. Um, let me introduce them uh, very briefly, although their bios are very long. I'm going to just pick and choose uh, some of their highlights from their career. Uh, I'll start with Kier Jais, who the, who's a senior consulting fellow at the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House. Um, Kier has supported uh, the Institute or Chatham House since 2013. Previously, he worked with the BBC Monitoring Service and the UK Defence Academy, where he wrote and advised on basically everything Russia. And uh, he's the author of multiple publications explaining the Russian approach to uh, warfare, including NATO's Handbook of Russian Information War Warfare. We have few copies uh, on. We don't. Okay, they're gone then. We don't have coffees. Um, and he's written like, you know, like several sort of like articles and papers. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I will, however, mention uh, a recent paper for Chatham House that Kier has written on the topic of the discussion today, uh, uh, entitled Russian Cyber and Information Warfare in Practice. I think we have some copies of that, so please uh, do take them uh, before you leave. Uh, our second uh, speaker is Belen Carrasco Rodriguez, uh, Project Director at the Eyes on Russia, the Center for Information Resilience. Uh, this organization was established to investigate, document, and expose uh, Russia's human rights abuses, war crimes, and information operations and its full-scale invasion of Ukraine through open source uh, investigation. And she's going to be talking to us uh, tonight about, about this. Uh, prior to uh, uh, her current job, Belen worked at the NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence investigating covert influence techniques by state actors, Russia and their proxies. And she was also an associate director at open source intelligence consultancy Neon Century. Welcome, Belen. And uh, finally, um, Olga Tokariuk, who is the Open Society University Network Academy Fellow at the Ukraine uh, Forum here at Chatham House. Uh, Olga has a, a background in journalism uh, with a focus on international affairs and encounter disinformation research. She's a former fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford and a non-resident fellow at SEPA, the Center for European Policy analysis. So welcome uh, to all of you. And before we start the discussion, um, just a few uh, housekeeping uh, uh, notes. So this event is not under the rule. It's on the record and it is being recorded. So you're free to take pictures, attribute, um, tweet, everything you want to do, you're free to do so. Um, we are 
uh, we will have the first part of this discussion will be a moderated discussion with the, with the, with the panelists, and then we'll turn to you for uh, your questions online and in the room. So please uh, prepare those, and we will make sure that we leave enough time for them. So. With that, I'd like to start uh, with you, Kia, and with my first question, um, before we go into sort of talking about what happened in Ukraine, I was wondering whether you can walk us a little bit through the Russian approach. Um, and what does this sort of Russian approach to cyber and information warfare look like? And how is it different than how Western nations think about, about these two kind of uh, uh, fields? And what are the practical implications of these differences on defense and, and security thinking? I don't think I'll walk you through the whole of the Russian approach because we have... We only... take a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there is... Unfortunately, not really a short way of saying it, except it is totally different from how information activities, information operations uh, were understood in Western militaries. Uh, this time, 10 years ago, I was doing quite a lot of going around explaining what Russia was thinking and how the, the doctrine on using information for strategic effect was developing, talking to bits of NATO, um, allied militaries, uh, those parts of the UK system that, that could be induced to take an interest. And that made it very clear that there was a huge divergence between how Russia was thinking about developing this as a war-winning tool and how it was seen in Western militaries. This was not at all how NATO as a whole thought about information or its, or its individual members. And then, of course, you had the Russian seizure of Crimea, which demonstrated some of those Russian ideas uh, in practice. If I, I'll try to keep it brief and, and narrow it down to two key points, which were so very different from how uh, information confrontation was envisaged on our side. First of all, the fact that it is permanent. Mm. The name says information warfare, but this is something that happens all the time. It is not dependent on a state of peace or war. If you are a perceived adversary of Russia, whether you know it or not, then you are going to be the target of information warfare activities. And secondly, it's holistic. It brings into itself so many different disciplines that at the time when this became prominent, most Western militaries would actually silo into different areas of activity. You had cyber, you had information operations like psychological operations, you had influence, you had strategic communications. All of these different disciplines for Russia come under this single heading of information warfare. And for them, it was uh, an artificial distinction to treat cyber as something different from information warfare. The important point was the information. Cyber was just the technical representation of information. So it was another means by which you would deliver the information that you are trying to get across to your target. And so um, delivering something by email, for example, wouldn't be conceptually different from delivering it via print media or walking up to somebody on the street and telling them. It would all be the same thing. I brought along um, a, a glossary, a Russian glossary of information security terms that we borrowed a while back from the, the Academy of the General <laughs> Staff because the definition in here of information warfare is really enlightening. It includes so many different aspects of things that, that we think are totally different, including uh, things which see even now don't form a part of our concept of this information confrontation, like electronic warfare, like acoustic security. How exactly do you intercept uh, somebody else's communications through acoustic insecurity listening and in basically. So all of these different elements came together in the Russian idea. And the really important part, of course, is that cyber 10 years ago, there wasn't even a Russian word for cyber activities. It was so uh, unfamiliar as a separate context that um, they, they borrowed some of the Western te terminology. So it's an integrated challenge in much the same way that China mm -hmm. treats information in the same way, as an integrated challenge. And so defenses against them similarly have to be integrated and cover all of those different holistic <coughs> aspects in order to be complete. Do you see Western countries going in a direction of sort of addressing those challenges, challenges in an integrated way? Or do you still see that there's still like some big separations that are impeding like a good and holistic response? No, that has happened. There has been what uh, some Western countries have referred to a as a process of convergence, where they're bringing together all of these different aspects of the challenge and trying to see them as an integrated whole. 
uh, Russia, by contrast, didn't have to go through convergence because they never diverged in the first place. So um, if you have the same conversations today going to um, Western armed forces and talking about information operations, there's a lot of very active thinking about how it can be used. And uh, you have to respond, well, yes, that's all very nice. Trouble is the Russians were working this out 20 years ago, so there's quite a lot of catching up to do. Particularly when you want to translate or like take it outside of just the armed forces and kind of like at a whole of government uh, level. Uh, but let's talk about what happened in Ukraine and how did this approach manifest uh, uh, on the ground. You talked about it's permanent, it's holistic, it's not related to kind of like peace and war. But ultimately there are some sort of like dimensions to their approach that, that, will have, that we've seen in Ukraine that are kind of worth mentioning. What, what, what are they? Yes, things that we were expecting to happen when it did move to, to full-scale conflict. Um, and I say expecting because we were tracking, we were watching carefully, not only what the thinking part of the Russian military and intelligence services were saying about what you can do with information, but also the process of testing and implementation and trying out new tools. We saw that happening in Ukraine itself. We saw it happening in Syria. We even saw it happening across the frontier with NATO into the Baltic states. On each of these occasions, you can see Russia attempting something and then um, shelving it and then putting it aside. And then it resurfaced when, uh, when it was put into use in Ukraine in February 2022. So there are lots of different examples of the things that we saw um, happening that came out. I'll just take a, a few of them. Um, one of them was information interdiction, information isolation, trying to make sure that the people who you are attempting to influence don't have any outside sources of information other than what is being provided to them by Russia. Now, in that respect, Russia built on the success in Crimea, which for a while was held up as the, the gold standard of conducting operations uh, with the use of information because it was a massive geostrategic gain which involved only a few shots fired and only one fatality, and that was an accident. And they said, this is because we achieved complete information isolation, first through print and broadcast media, and then moving to target the single points of failure for internet connection within Crimea so that they had no other sources of information of what was going on. So Russia looked around the world at other, way, other places where that could be replicated. Uh, there aren't many that reproduce the exact same conditions as Crimea, but that's what lay behind the intensive program that we observed in 2015 through 2017 of reconnoitering subsea networks, satellites, mm -hmm. all of the different points of vulnerability that Russia could target to reproduce the same effect. Mm -hmm. So that was attempted um, in Ukraine. We also saw things like tailored, targeted disinformation, things which are um, not mass produced but delivered directly to people's connected devices with an attempt to make it specific to them. We saw use of cyber to assist both of those, not as a standalone tool, but actually facilitating all of these other aims and, of course, the external disinformation campaigns that were directed not at Ukraine, but at other audiences, like, for example, Russia itself domestically or, or at us, the West. But some of the, the points that you mentioned about the expectations for, for massive destructive strikes were actually constrained by how Russia thought this operation was going to go. Because if you believe that this is a three-day special military operation as opposed to a war, you're going to take things over intact as opposed to destroying them. And that includes the infrastructure that you would otherwise have, have um, eliminated in order to facilitate your ore aims. So there was limited destruction. But one thing that did work very well, tragically, was the way in which Russia exploited personally identifiable information on individual people to conduct their campaign of rounding up individuals that they saw as a threat in the temporarily occupied territories for murder, torture, interrogation, filtration, whatever it might be. And there, they exploited information that was acquired through cyber means that we might not necessarily think as a national security challenge. Things like health <coughs> records, insurance records, things that you don't necessarily think of as needing protecting beyond privacy legislation. But here, it was exploited to reproduce in the invasion of Ukraine the same procedures that we saw from Russia in past centuries, for example, moving into the Baltic states, <coughs> rounding people up for deportation and enslavement. Mm -hmm. That tells us how much this information needs to be protected in order not to replicate that situation elsewhere. 
great, thank you. Um, Belenk, if I, if I can go to you and through the work that you do um, in Eyes of Russia, it's all about documenting what's been happening. So uh, Kier talked about sort of the information isolation, the targeted disinformation, cyber, but limited destruction, however, cyber as a support of the, the, the influence and this exploitation of, of, of personal information. What, what is it that you've seen from, from your, your, your organization? Yes, so for a bit of context, because I think that I am the only one that is not from the house today. So Eyes on Russia has been um, documenting since December 2021, so since before the beginning of the full-scale invasion, uh, using open source investigations to document uh, Russian uh, crimes, uh, like Russian military movements, and at the same time influence operations. And at the same time, we spend a significant part of, of our times in Ukraine working with prosecutors and law enforcement in war crime investigations including Russian operations in the inf informational and cyber domains. So from this work, um, I would say that what we've seen in the um, cognitive, like with uh, regards to Russia's cognitive manipulation and information operations, is that uh, Russian information operation activities have had a different level of success and coordination um, depending on the target. So Russian information operations have had limited success uh, when uh, reaching Ukrainian audiences and uh, main uh, efforts have been driven towards um, influencing audiences within the temporarily occupied territories. Um, then when it comes to global audiences, we see moderate and uneven level of success with highest impact in those countries with lower levels of resilience or historical exposure to Russian influence operations. And finally, significant levels of success in what comes to influencing Russian audiences, spe specifically those audiences based in Russia because of pre-invasion levels of influence and um, uh, other factors like the isolation of the information environment. So in Ukraine specifically, uh, we have seen, as I said, limited uh, instances of success, but some of them, uh, some of their attempts to control the information environment have been successful. Mm -hmm. For example, Joe's attempts uh, at trying to spin the narrative in the uh, temporarily occupied territories or obscure um, or establish plausible deniabilities in the commission of war crimes or crimes against civilians. Uh, so for example, what we have seen is the um, establishing this dichotomy between occupy, occupiers and liberators. So there have been a lot of activities uh, uh, focus at uh, delivering humanitarian aid, uh, taking care of children, uh, supporting uh, women um, in temporary occupied territories, just by, uh, like, in order to provide protection and a feeling of comfort that uh, detaches the audiences <coughs> from, uh, like, the occupation, um, like, perception, and builds that this image of liberators. And this uh, uh, strategy has been amplified by embedding Russian or pro-Russian propagandists within specific units and battalions on the ground. So they film um, like Russian units delivering humanitarian aid or celebrating, organi organizing celebrations for the International Children's Day and children's being happy and very grateful that the Russians are there and they film this sort of content and they spread it in their different several social media channels in order to build this image of Russians as liberators versus like Russians as occupiers. And other instances of success we can see when uh, establishing, shedding, casting doubt on attribution for uh, crimes against civilians and this is the recurring narrative of legitimate military targets within uh, civilian facilities in, uh, that has, have been targeted with uh, significant levels of civilian casualties. Some of them, I'm not saying that it's never true, like some, in some instances there have been legitimate military targets inside these facilities, but this this is a recurring narrative that Russia uses sometimes in a misleading way, like many times in a misleading way, to disrupt justice and accountability efforts. And in temporarily occupied territories, these softer uh, means of influence are always joined by like harder uh, means of influence, mm -hmm. just like a physical coercion or indirect coercion, let's say door-to-door -door visits or abductions in order to spread fear so inhabitants of a specific area do not share uh, the reality on the ground. And uh, of course, like the <laughs> recruitment and establishing, uh, establishment of a network of Ukrainian collaborators that take over communication platforms and um, actually take over the, the full you know, communication of the regional administration and the basic uh, service providers. 
Um, but beyond these uh, specific instances, targeted instances of successful uh, information operations, uh, and as I said, mainly happening in temporarily occupied territories or in occupational activities, uh, we can say that uh, Ukrainian resistance and resilience against Russian influence efforts has been extremely high. So yeah, that would be my take. <laughs> great, great way to end, to yeah. end your intervention. Um, Olga, um, if I can come to you and ask you whether, I mean, we've heard uh, Kier and, and uh, Belen talk about uh, how the sort of the, 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 the Russian sort of operation manifested in the Ukrainian context. Was there any of it a surprise uh, uh, from, from the Ukrainian point of view? And how did, did the Ukrainians respond? Yeah, well, um, I think I won't exaggerate if I say that it wasn't a surprise, that most of the tactics that Russia used since uh, February 22 were already used by Russia in Ukraine since 2014, when the invasion of Crimea and Donbass uh, first started. So that was accompanied by a massive disinformation campaign, by, by an attempt to disrupt uh, and penetrate the information space, to pollute it, to, uh, uh, you know, wage war in the inf information sp uh, space. And then it caught Ukrainians by surprise. But since then, a lot of capacity has been developed, both on the government level and on the civil society level, so that Ukrainians were already resilient enough to withstand Russian attacks. Russian didn't invent any, like, silver bullet. You know, they didn't approach the full-scale invasion in a particularly innovative way. So most of uh, the actions that they um, uh, planned were easily predictable, and therefore Ukraine managed to resist them, thanks to the capacity, thanks to the resi experience that was already uh, already there, but also thanks to uh, cooperation with various uh, uh, foreign entities, again, on the governmental level, on in the private sector. I think we'll elaborate on that a little bit uh, later. And, you know, talking about uh, how Ukraine responded. So, well, I, I am a Ukrainian, and I was in Ukraine in the very first uh, s seven months uh, of the Russian full-scale invasion before I came here to the UK. And I saw uh, with my own eyes how, you know, like, all society basically mobilized to uh, not just defend Ukraine on the battlefield, like those people who felt the, you know, the um, uh, energy and, you know, who, who felt um, uh, that they had to do that, they took up arms, but those who didn't even join the fight physically on the battlefield, they still ask themselves, how, how can we help, how can we contribute? And therefore, this effort to resist Russian uh, attack in the information space, uh, while the government did prepare for it, while the government uh, tried to do something by, for example, centralizing the, uh, um, in, uh, flow, the information flow by uniting uh, Ukrainian TV channels in a so-called United TV marathon, uh, so that people would have access to um, reliable information well, now, obviously, there are a lot of questions how, uh, you know, that is still, um, whether it's still necessary to have that United TV Marathon two years into war. But in the early stage of the invasion, that proved to be a, a good decision to give people access to um, credible information. But uh, in addition to government level, to, to government actions, uh, the, the actions of civil society were very instrumental. I would, uh, you know, uh, highlight the role of the, med the, the media play, the journalists play, so not only the United Team Americans, but a lot of other Ukrainian independent media outlets that continued operating, reporting from the ground, that was really crucial. Then, um, you know, Ukrainian um, uh, groups, hacktivists, so-called hacktivist groups, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, repelled Russian uh, uh, cyber, uh, 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 attacks, uh, warn about them, and also try to disrupt Russian and penetrate Russian information space, and you know, uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, in the interest of Ukraine. And many Ukrainian also tech companies, businesses, they um, uh, join the effort of resistance by. Uh, uh, you know, uh, offering the government their services, their capacity. Uh, some of them are using new technology, artificial intelligence, and they cooperate with the government to detect uh, Russian um, disinformation and, um, you know, inf influence campaigns. Um, and just, I, I just observed how ordinary citizens, they also were trying to do whatever they, they could by um, taking on social media, uh, 
what must be noted is that Ukraine severely limited also the access of Russian uh, actors to its um, and, and their capacity to penetrate Ukrainian information space by banning Russian TV channels, by banning uh, Ukrainian TV channels that had links to Russia uh, in the years preceding the full-scale invasion, the decision that has been criticized by some organizations at the time, but that proved to be really crucial because uh, at the moment of the full-scale invasion, Ukraine didn't have those hostile agents operating on its territory. So these decisions proved to be really important. So Russia, without having access to Ukraine mainstream media and without having uh, agents of influence who were allowed to operate freely in Ukraine. They relied increasingly on social media, on direct targeted messaging of Ukrainian citizens. And the Ukrainian citizens, in cooperation with the government, were able to counter that and to uh, even take a part of that information warfare to the territory of Russia. We've heard of the instances of Ukrainian uh, hackers uh, breaching Russian TV networks, transmitting their uh, speeches of President Zelensky, for example. Um, so yeah, thanks to the capacity that has been there, Ukraine, I would say, was quite successful, which doesn't mean that the situation is not changing. The situation is dynamic, and we have seen that in the last weeks and months, some Russian attempts uh, to breach uh, Ukrainian cyber de defenses have been successful. There, there were Russian cyber attacks on Ukrainian uh, mobile network provider Kyiv Star just before New Year. Just uh, 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 last week, there were uh, several days ago, there were attacks on Ukrainian postal services, on uh, Ukrainian banks that were successful. So some attacks are repelled. Some attacks are successful. Russians keep trying, they keep learning, but Ukrainians keep learning too. Brilliant, thank you. And I think this sort of like whole of society approach that the Ukraine has demonstrated has been the source of admiration for, you know, for, for, for many. But whether we, this can be replicated in other contexts, I think that's something that we will uh, come to towards uh, the end of, of, of this part. Um, but here, I want to come back to you to ask you about, because we talked uh, at the beginning, um, and you talk a lot in your paper about the role that the private sector has played in, in, in defending uh, Ukraine. Um, so if you can tell us a little bit more about the role that international partners and, and industry played in that, how important was it and how did it manifest? What are the kind of some of the key trends that we, we saw that we haven't seen before? Well, all has already mentioned the, uh, the international coalition that was supporting Ukraine before the full-scale invasion that was trying to build resilience, both in cyber terms and information terms, to the best extent they could, the US, the UK, Canada, other international partners. But it wasn't just state support. There were also private industry uh, doing things which, again, had a new, unique factor that we've not seen before that's played out in this conflict. And that is um, ordinary companies actually playing a direct role in ensuring the survival of Ukraine by ensuring its resilience. Now, some of those are, uh, are companies that people may not necessarily have heard of dealing with just, for example, cybersecurity, like organizations like uh, Mandiant, for example, or the, the threat-focused bits of Microsoft. Others are household names, and they were playing a key role in making sure that Ukraine could, in fact, survive. Amazon, for example, uh, organizing the evacuation of key government data when it they looked as though there was a risk of where it was being held being overrun, removing it to the cloud so that the country can continue to function. In the same way that, uh, for example, countries like um, Estonia set up data embassies previously because they knew that this was a, a present risk. Um, Google extending its, uh, its protection against low-level attacks over Ukrainian media and then a whole range of other Ukrainian critical websites in the days before the invasion and therefore thwarting a number of Russian attacks intended to take them offline. They stayed up because uh, the, while as an individual website there would have been no match for what was thrown at them by Russia, once they were uh, under this extended protection of Google, the level of the attacks were described by them as, as trivial. All of these things, and particularly the way in which cybersecurity companies were ensuring the resilience of, of Ukrainian networks and Ukrainian information integrity, made it a hostile environment for Russian information and cyber operations because everybody was working against them. Now, that brings up a whole load of other um, implications for where exactly that might go in the future because there's also uh, the element that the, the long experience that Ukraine had of countering disinformation, of making sure that, uh, that their, um, their information space was resilient, not just based on the previous eight years of war, but even before that, was a key factor. But uh, without this additional outside, 
support, which may or may not be conditional in future conflicts, mm -hmm. it would have been very much harder for Ukraine to withstand mm -hmm. the level of attacks that we've seen. And you talked about this importance of um, that this international coalition was in place before the attack happened and the importance of, of, of preparedness that can be hard to actually sort of like, you know, uh, materialize in, in other conflicts. But of course, this sort of like the role, the big role that the private sector has played in this has also sort of like, you know, put, um, you know, uh, in focus the role of new actors in conflict, particularly in this kind of context. So what are some of the issues that have arisen as a result of the private sector engagement? And, and that's the kind of the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, how do you think the private sector will engage in future conflicts? What will make them decide, yes, this is a conflict that we want to support, this is a conflict that we want to support? And what, is, what are the, sort of, some of the risks of, 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 of those approaches? Well, on your very first point, on the preparedness, on being ready ahead of it, of course, this here too, Ukraine was in a unique situation. that You didn't see any of the surprise or any of the measures during what uh, Russian doctrinal writers would call the initial period of war because there was no initial period of war. It had already been ongoing. So there's plenty of opportunity to recognize the challenge and put things in place. But on the second point, uh, the, the decisions that were made by large and small information and technology companies were largely based on a values choice. They saw what was happening to Ukraine. They thought that their values were consistent with defending Ukraine against aggression. Now, the long-term cost of that engagement and that support is becoming more clear. And of course, for a company the size of behemoths like uh, Microsoft, that is not significant. For others, it may well become a serious issue. So that presents a choice in future. Do you, in fact, join in if you have an open-ended commitment and no guarantee that there is going to be support, for example, from, um, from state sponsors or financing from elsewhere? There's also the point that in, in many instances, the way in which these corporations have joined in, just like the, the hacktivists, the IT army from Ukraine, the people who are taking active part in withstanding and sometimes counteracting Russian information operations, erodes the line between civilians and combatants. Now, that might be a very theoretical and academic distinction in the, in the context of a war with Russia, because nobody is expecting for a moment that going, Russia is going to uh, observe the defined distinctions of law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law. But it does have implications for how those develop in future. And in particular, it will complicate any possible eventual search for justice, <laughs> complicate prosecutions, if those protections to which people would normally, normally be entitled mm -hmm. because they are not actually taking part in hostile operations become undermined and become eroded. That's a serious implication, and it's one of the uh, one of the things that needs to be worked out before we have the next iteration of this kind of conflict. Just like the long-term status of um, of private industry, who is going to support them? Who's going to make sure that they make the right choice in future? So, to take a a really simplistic example, if we have in the future a Chinese move against Taiwan, is there any guarantee? that IT companies which have substantial exposure still to China are going to be as willing to protect Taiwan as they were Ukraine. And of course, there are sort of this issue of accountability, right? And issues of like, you know, sort of the decisions to go or not to go or when, like, and we've seen that with Elon Musk and the, you know, the, the support and all of that. So I guess then the question is, how do you organize that relationship and that, 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 that troll? Uh, what would be the best way to do that? And who should lead the charge? That's precisely the problem which the, the major IT companies are grappling with. Now, Elon Musk is a, is a special case in so many ways. The, the example of Starlink and the way the Starlink system actually replaced a large sector of Ukrainian military and civilian communications is probably the most publicized example of how private industry has been this vital enabler for, for Ukraine to continue to survive. But it's also, as a result of that, and as a result of its unique ownership structure, it's been the most obvious case where some of the problems with that relationship become clear. So do you want, as a country fighting a war of national survival, to be in a position where one of your vital capabilities for survival is actually in the hands of somebody who can change his mind about whether it's going to be provided or not at a moment's notice? Mm. That's an extreme example. But the same issues 
apply across the board for all of these organizations, external organizations that are supporting Ukraine. Great, thank you. Um, I want to now move to the sort of last part of this discussion to talk about what are some of the lessons uh, that other countries can, can, can take. Um, because, of course, there are so some uh, that can be applied and some that are context specific. So I'd like to ask you for your opinion about what are some of the lessons that you would like to share with other countries and what are some of the ones that you think, well, no, these are very much Ukrainian specific. Can I start with you, Olga? Yes. So I think, well, the lessons are what I mentioned in my, in my first uh, answer, that uh, there should be decentralized effort, or at least it shouldn't be centralized, the effort to, you know, resist uh, the aggression in the information space. So the government shouldn't monopolize kind of this effort because it can't be as uh, fast, it can't be as creative uh, if uh, it is just led by the government. So the role of civil society is crucial and building that capacity in civil society can start well ahead of any possible attack. So, you know, increasing um, awareness about the information threats, about, you know, the ways Russia and other uh, authoritarian uh, hostile states, they wage, uh, they wage war uh, in, in the information domain. So increasing awareness of, in the society, increasing the resilience of the society. Uh, or it's not just media literacy, there are various tools, but just, you know, just like not being silent about that and raising the awareness about the threat is, is really important. Uh, then what Ukraine, I, I think, actually was very good at, and that's the, uh, something that can be applied in other contexts, that if we're talking about disinformation, uh, just debunking is not working. You need to apply other tools to how to counter disinformation. And Ukraine was using uh, pre-bunking as a tool a lot. So actually uh, warning and saying that, you know, this is about to happen. We see signs of this and that based on data. So that sending the signal to the population that, you know, this is likely to happen, so better be pre prepared. That worked really well. Uh, in this, actually, Ukraine used a lot of, because Russia is obviously using technology and AI, uh, it is tries to use that to provide, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, manufacture deep fakes, uh, Zelensky's illusionary deep fakes that Russia uh, released were not particularly convincing, but still they are trying, they are playing with the, with the technology, they are playing um, uh, with it to um, achieve their goals. But Ukrainians are using that too in order to actually do these pre-bunking campaigns because th thanks to AI tools, they collect a lot of data, what is happening in the information space, so they are able to monitor and predict some of Russia's movements. And if, uh, you know, this is already kind of being released in the information space, uh, the same thing as with intelligence sharing uh, before the full-scale invasion, when everybody or uh, at least a lot of actors were aware that this is going to happen, it allowed the time and space to prepare, to take it more seriously, to take uh, contingency uh, measures. So here, pre-bunking is, is, is really a good lesson, I think. And then uh, um, the third lesson is um, the importance of creative approach. Uh, the importance of using humor, for example, to counter this information. It's, it might not be the most obvious tool, but both me and Kier, we published uh, uh, papers on uh, how Ukrainians used humor in strategic communications and countering this information. This information. And there are lessons to be learned from those. Um, uh, go and read our papers, <laughs> please. <laughs> You're taking the opportunity to advertise them. Um, and then the last one uh, is, uh, I think what is important is cooperation with tech companies. Mm -hmm. Without that, uh, the governments, or just, uh, you know, the civil societies, they are unable to do many things if there is no support, mm -hmm. uh, not just from other governments, but from big tech. Mm -hmm. So cooperation with big tech uh, is essential. Mm -hmm. Are there any lessons that you can think of that you say, well, you know, these are just for this context and cannot be transferable, particularly as countries are thinking about how to protect their elections? Well. I think uh, these are all lessons that can be implemented in other contexts. I don't think any of them cannot be implemented, but maybe my colleagues have uh, something to add. Thank you. Um, yeah, th I think I'm going to be brief because uh, we probably need uh, some time for Q&A. But I would say that some lessons that, that we can take from the Ukrainian uh, example are, uh, first of all, like proactivity and forward planning. So um, Ukraine was great at proactive strategic communications, 
um, supported by Western governments and multilateral organizations disclosing, for example, secret intelligence uh, ahead of Russia's full-scale invasion, that then it could be used to assess Russia's intentions and capabilities. And um, also uh, what Ukraine was great at is uh, at uh, spreading uh, morale-boosting messages amplified by a highly active diaspora that actually kept the morale very high before the full-scale invasion, and this made society more resilient. I would say that also an, a lesson learned that we can take is um, cutting the incentive, monitoring or and sanctioning uh, those collaborators that are benefiting from the amplification of Russian uh, influence operations in domestic media environments. So not uh, only Ukraine had collaborators. Russia uh, uses uh, like as an like the, the main uh, well one of the main doors for uh, Russian uh, influence are uh, domestic actors that networks of domestic actors that speak the, the the language understand societal divisions understand audiences so Russia can use them to reach audiences and actually disrupt uh, processes like elections so these individuals these networks. Um, happen uh, globally and they are transnational but uh, they're like domestic networks that could be uh, identified and could be disrupted and I think that uh, I, like there have been uh, in the previous years like more efforts driven towards disrupting these sort of networks but there should be a huge focus ahead of an heavy electoral year and finally uh, I would I would jump on the boat of the whole of society approach uh, for um, like to replicate uh, from the Ukrainian example in um, any sort of effort to counter Russian influence abroad. I would add two notes. I think that the Ukrainian example is unique in terms of like time uh, being exposed to Russian influence operations and like some uh, like countries that might relate uh, to a lesser um, level, it would be just like uh, Eastern Europe. So there has been just like a long term exposure to Russian infor information operations, which make them like more resilient and with better systems built and societal resilience built to counter this sort of like uh, threats and also um, uh, high morale. So Ukrainians are defending their uh, territory integrity, their country, they are seeking justice. This is um, an element that helps resilience that other uh, countries and jurisdictions don't have. Ukrainians are fighting and that unifies the country against a common threat. Thank you. And Kier, same same question to you. And, and uh, I guess we've talked a lot about how much 2014 was helped prepare the Ukrainians for, for, for you know, for these kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, operations, but also like because they have been exposed for a long time, they know what to expect. Nothing was a surprise we heard from, from Olga. So this makes Ukraine particularly, you know, quite an, an interesting and to a certain extent a unique case study. So what other countries can learn from that experience? Well, the biggest lesson is how significant Russian information warfare capabilities mm. can be if not countered. Mm. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, really should be driven home from, from mm. the experience of Ukraine. Uh, this, back in 2016, uh, one of the things that the NATO handbook of Russian information mm. warfare tried to emphasize was the different levels of ambition for what Russia thought it could achieve mm. using information tactical and operational and strategic right up to bringing about regime change in the target country. And so by complete coincidence, just a few months later, there was the US 2016 election demonstrating precisely what they actually meant by that. The problem, of course, uh, with that is that you have to be prepared and ready and actually understanding the implications of getting this problem wrong. And Ukraine gives us the case study. Imagine what would have happened if Russia's intelligence and security agencies reporting back to the Kremlin on the state of Ukrainian society and the readiness for it to be deposed and overthrown by a swift military operation had been correct. And the long-running campaigns that they had undertaken to subvert Ukrainian society, to sow distrust between people, between people and institutions, between people and government, had been successful. 
then we would be looking at a very, very different war and the loss of Ukraine altogether. This is what is at stake when Russia undertakes these campaigns. Now, in this particular case, it was a combination of Ukraine being in the sweet spot for so many reasons. It sounds a bizarre thing to say, looking at the trauma that Ukraine is going through. But all of these things that we've discussed were counting in Ukraine's favor. The international support, the societal resilience, the threat perception, all of these things. How many other places around the world are there that can rely on all of those advantages? Particularly because as you look across Europe, North America, the West, even the world, you see this patchwork of different regulatory and legislative and social and constitutional environments, which means some things can be emulated that we've seen Ukraine do, many absolutely cannot. And we heard just now about the, the wrapping up of the networks of agents of influence working on behalf of Russia. It is only in November last year that in this country it actually became illegal to work as an agent of a hostile power against this country. We'll see sooner or later where that actually becomes enforced. So that's the first step here locally for taking action against those enablers and facilitators for Russian information warfare campaigns. We know who they are, we know what they do, we know why they do it, but nothing's been done about it. Replicate that across the whole of Europe and you've got all of the different constraints that militate against actually being in that position to resist effectively. Just very quickly before we open the floor, there is the, and a lot of what we've talked about, there is that, that the Russian actions were almost predictable, right? Like the Ukrainians knew what Russia uh, uh, was, was preparing and they prepared accordingly and the international coalition came and stepped up, up and helped. What does this tell us about how the, uh, how the Russians might adapt their, their approaches? How, what should we expect? Because I guess, you know, now they've realized well, we can do what we've been doing because they, they know what we're doing. We need to change the approach. What, what do you think, how do you think that will influence their, their uh, ways going forward? It's hard to say because when, um, when Russia observes that what it is trying to do is not particularly competent or effective, there are different ways in which it responds. Sometimes it comes back with a better mm. implementation of the same thing. Sometimes it regresses. Look at the current efforts at reconstitution of Russian land forces following their evisceration in the early stages of the Ukraine war. It's not another attempt to, uh, to build what they saw as a high-tech modern army ready for 21st century warfare. Instead, it's falling back on older methods. So when we see, for instance, some of the information warfare tools being used in Ukraine that were tested in 2015, 2016, 2017, and then put on the shelf and not updated. And the, uh, we heard about the, the crudeness of the deep fakes that have been used. They were weeks out of date in that they were deployed um, far too late to have an impact on public opinion. Uh, should have been right at the very beginning of the invasion, but also years out of date because they were so behind where technology actually is. What we haven't seen yet is Russia adapting to that, at least not seen in, in public sources, is Russia adapting to that by actually updating to what could be achieved. But that could be just around the corner because we've known for some time that artificial intelligence, machine learning, will vastly increase the speed and the scale and the customization of disinformation campaigns. This is going to be a tsunami-like challenge in terms of resisting disinformation much on the same scale as with the arrival of the internet and that transformation of the challenge that happened mm, then. Mm, great, thank you. Okay, let's open the floor. Let's, I'm gonna take three at a time, uh, the lady here and then the gentleman and uh, lady here, please. Thank you for speaking today. I'm Dr. Nadeau, member of Chatham House, uh, contractor with the U.S. Air Force here in the U.K. Given um, uh, Russia's growing ties with Iran and uh, probably their ad advice and support that's going on behind the scenes, how do you expect Iran to um, maybe ad adopt or adapt or allow Russia to um, guide them or help them in their own disinformation campaign and further destabilizing the Middle East? Joe Barker from Imperial College. You spoke a bit about the use of healthcare data and kind of different data sets. How concerned should we be about large scale data breaches of private companies? There was recently 23andMe was breached, was a DNA sequencing company. Do we know if Russia is using this data yet? And how hyper personalized will the disinformation campaigns be using this data? Thank you. 
Um, very quickly, uh, I hope. Uh, Tricia de Borgra, of, uh, current affairs writer, I thank you very much for this. It's absolutely fascinating. I think we all find that. Um, was there any evidence that Russia sort of fooled itself by its own uh, disinformation when it came to Crimea in 2014? Because there was a book written that, that touched upon that, that it seemed like a lot of Russian speakers in Crimea were terrified of Ukrainians coming to uh, kill them and all sorts of things. And, and it's a great book, I, I could forget its name, but, but it was very much that sense that they were on Russia's side because they were, mm. they were terrified of Ukrainians and the Nazis coming to, to you know, pillage them. And then second, is there any evidence that, you know, when you look at, and I don't mean uh, the disaffected in America voting for Trump, I'm meaning MAGA voters who seem to be isolated in terms of information. Is there any evidence that, that uh, the, the Trump um, camp is using any sorts of disinformation on American voters? And thirdly, very quickly, because you do so much work in this, um, in the end, what was the Havana syndrome? Because I've heard that nobody really, you know, apparently it wasn't some terrible thing, although it's hard to believe that people with brain injuries weren't subjected to something. Thank you Great. so much. Great, thank you. So let's do like a quick round. You pick whatever question you'd like to answer, but very briefly so we can take a, a round or two, please. Mr. Trump, super briefly, do threat actors like Russia, Iran, China, the Trump campaign learn from each other? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, they do. Um, because you see now the Trump campaign picking on elements uh, that have been seen in successful Russian information campaigns and reusing them. And it's not just them, of course. This is around the world. It's been observed that this works, so bad people pick it up and use it. Just last week, there was a, um, a threat advisory from the um, NCSC here in the UK, which was describing spear phishing attempts um, at targeting us, effectively, including some of the people in this room, including uh, something that's going to be written up probably this week, Alexander. Very good. It'll be written up this week. But the really interesting thing about it is it describes campaigns that are running in parallel by Russia and Iran using precisely the same methodology because it works, because they, they're actually achieving the effects in targeting the people that they want to target and extracting the information that they want to use, which comes on to the, the data breaches question. Is Russia using it? Well, not visibly as far as anybody has documented yet. Would Russia be willing and able to use it? Absolutely, yes, because it provides that leverage. And of course, let's not forget, when we look at what's happening online, we shouldn't think that that is necessarily the center of gravity of malign influence because human factors are so absolutely vital. It's not all about trolling on social media. It's not disinformation there. The, having the right person influenced to say the wrong thing in the wrong ears at the wrong moment is going to be vastly more important for Russia than thousands of troll armies on Twitter. So leveraging those human factors, including, for example, by exploitation of personal information that they've extracted, will be extremely <coughs> useful. In Crimea, yes, absolutely. The fact that they had um, cut off all of these other sources of information so people only had what they were being told by Russia uh, to go on did leave people convinced that, as the Russians were telling them, the Russian soldiers are here to protect you because fascists from Kiev are coming to kill you. If you've got no counterpoint to that, how do you know not to believe it? But again, it's a technique that has been observed in use by Russia, and frontline states are taking countermeasures. Because with the information isolation, one thing that people expected was it would be accompanied by calls for surrender in precisely the same ways we saw from Zelensky. So the crisis preparedness booklets that are distributed to everybody in the population in countries like Latvia and Sweden include in big red letters, if you hear that the central authorities have told you to give up resistance and surrender, this is disinformation, this is fake news, because people are ready for it. And um, the Havana syndrome, that I, the honest answer is I do not know, but I am equally untrusting of the most recent descriptions of what that is and where it comes from, what it isn't, as you are. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. Um, just probably very quick. Um, yeah, I would I would jump on uh, the fact that yes, uh, different type of uh, disinformation or information operations actors um, 
uh, learn from each other, not only learn from each other, they interact with each other. So um, information, uh, information laundering networks like information operations are transnational and sometimes overlap interest. And I can put an example. So for example, uh, in July, um, there was a strike on a cafe in Kramatorsk uh, in July, on the 27th of July, 2023. And um, a Russian uh, disinformation apparatus just like took uh, a picture of the debris of the missile and disseminated the idea that uh, it will, it, this was uh, a storm shadow missile um, that had been uh, just like hit the, 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 the cafe. So this was picked by a MAGA network and, and suddenly became a U.S. conspiracy theory that the West was killing civilians uh, in Ukraine, right? So these networks interact with each other, they feed each other with content, and therefore they could be easily monitored, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, not only learn, but also interact. I would say that, yes, if Russia can, I don't know if, like, they, and I, I'm not a cyber expert, but I say just, like, if Russia can get any sort of compromised, uh, valuable information from any potential targets, it's going to use it, and it can use it tailoring these information activities to the individual level. And then um, also on the Crimea example, I would say that right now, I mean, we can see uh, like parallels with the, what happened in Crimea in other occupied territories, like for example, Mariupol. Mariupol has been almost for two years uh, with an absolutely isolated information environment, subjected constantly to uh, Russian propaganda with a completely replicated, so the, 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 um, the regional administration, of course, is in exile, is in the Dnipro, uh, and now there is just like a completely a duplicate administration structure that uh, like communicates with the citizens and portrays this um, uh, life of uh, like they are Russians, right? And we are talking about not only communication uh, from like regional administrations, it's also like the uh, public service providers and even in schools, they have replaced the uh, like uh, the books uh, and the history books and the, the books for, for first, first graders from Ukrainian to Russian and with Russian history. So this, this kind of thing, just like it's happening right now in, uh, in temporary occupied territories and it's highly concerning. Just very briefly, on uh, cooperation between Russia and other authoritarian regimes, just one short example from my uh, contacts in journalism. A journalist from the Philippines told me that there were trainings uh, organized by RT for uh, pro-government journalists in the Philippines. So the RT staff was brought from Russia to Philippines to <coughs> train journalists there how to cover them. So uh, that's just one example how they cooperate. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, also about Crimea. Uh, they, why this intimidation by propaganda was so successful also is because, as I said, in 2014, Ukraine was not prepared for it. And Ukraine learned the lesson. And actually, you know, it was not working in uh, 2022 for Russia, because when people saw, you know, the, the Russian missiles fly on the, on the cities, like in Kharkiv, in, in Odessa, even those people who may have had favorable attitudes to Russia, they very quickly changed them. So no amount of propaganda can change that if a missile is hitting your house, you know, that, that is not going to uh, change your opinion if you've seen that. But then, uh, as Belen very importantly mentioned, it, what is important is what then happens if Russia is allowed to occupy this territory. And then it's a completely cleared out information space. People don't have access to any information, huge scale repression, so that any uh, dissenting thought is repressed, people are being tortured, per killed, persecuted, and so on. So then, of course, it's a completely different information environment. Brilliant. I think maybe we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, the gentleman over there and the lady here. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Martin, UK editor for Recorded Future News here. I missed the first part of the panel discussion, so I apologise if this has been answered already. Um, how do the panel members expect societal resilience? Uh, what do the panel members expect societal resilience to look like, particularly in countries such as the UK and the US, and not just in terms of winning the argument, but preventing the adversary from having an effect? Hi, Sarah Hooper, uh, Metro newspaper. Uh, going back to the information bubble that you mentioned, obviously you've harped on sort of the importance of human-to-human -human connection and combating misinformation. Uh, if we look back to the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, obviously Russia's involvement in Afghanistan, which had a significantly less higher number of casualties than they've seen in Ukraine, is said to have contributed partially to the downfall of the information that had been pumped into Russian citizens about that. So my question is, as deaths continue to grow among Russian soldiers and 
obviously that information is entering Russia and reaching the people and they're feeling that. Uh, will this be enough to help break through the narrative that Putin has pumped out that the war is going well? Thank you. And before you answer, and you'll have like maybe 30 seconds to answer, a couple of like very quick questions from, or from the online crowd. Um, they're talking about how feasible it is that Russia might uh, target uh, um, uh, the infrastructure of a NATO country to distract the attention from Ukraine and the role that Telegram plays in spreading Russian disinformation. Do we have another so. hour? <laughs> okay. Very quickly. I'm super, sorry. super yeah. briefly. Yeah. Um, Alexander, how it does societal resilience look in, in other target countries? Extremely shaky for a number of different reasons, but, but most of all, the lack of the threat perception, the lack of political leadership, the lack of actually taking any steps to protect ourselves against the very obvious threat. Um, and Sarah, the, the problem with the, um, with Russians learning about what is being done uh, by their leadership in their name is that Russia has worked exceptionally hard at preventing that from happening. Uh, not just all of the soft filters that prevent information coming into Russia, but also, for instance, uh, eliminating the organizations that previously would have shared that information within civil society. So, as with so much else, Russia has been prepared for this for a long time in advance, and that is why, as we discussed at great length here in Chatham House yesterday, uh, Russia is likely to be resilient in these appalling conditions that they've inflicted on themselves for longer than we would like to see. Well, I slightly disagree with Kira. I think that actually uh, the information is rich in Russians. And if you know from a personal experience, even of my relatives who have relatives in Russia, have been trying to tell them, reach out to them and tell them what's happening, many people just don't want to hear because uh, if they accept that, you know, what the government is telling them is lies and the war they're waging in Ukraine is unjust, is unfair, is not the war with the West or with Nazis and so on, then they have to do something. And many of them are intimidated to the point that they just <coughs> do not see the space to do anything. So I would say that the information is reaching many Russian citizens. The, 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 another issue is that that the society in Russia is not prepared to rebel, to do something with that, you know, to, to stand up to the government and to uh, put a stop to the war. Also, because many uh, people are not prepared to see Russia losing. Many people agree that Ukraine somehow is a sphere of Russian influence and needs to be brought back, back into the fold. And uh, 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 very briefly also on um, on Telegram. Yeah, there was a question about Telegram from online. Uh, uh, Telegram now, uh, I would argue, is the main vehicle of Russian disinformation in Ukraine. So. Uh, uh, with uh, you know the access of Russian media such as RT, Sputnik, Russian TV channels, Russian uh, speakers, uh, Russian agents of influence completely restricted in Ukraine. Russian social media are not present there, such as uh, uh, VK and Adnoklasniki. Telegram has become the main vehicle with a lot of anonymous uh, channels. Uh, Telegram allows this anonymity that other uh, messaging uh, platforms do not allow. It is not secure, um, and uh, there are a lot of doubts. And there actually has been uh, have been testimonies of. Uh, Ukrainians who have been um, held in Russian-occupied territories, have been uh, held there in torture chambers, that uh, these people from FSB, from Russian secret services, they had access to all their messages and exchanges on Telegram, so that, that, that was somehow leaked and available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Helen. Uh, very quick. So I think that in terms of like societal resilience, very low. Uh, I think that we are suffering a hangover from uh, post-COVID uh, societal divisions still, and this is going to play a role in uh, the year that we have ahead. There is an, like there is a still you know like highly divisive uh, online discourse and an increase in the use of hate speech in online social media platforms, plus the proliferation of fringe social media platforms that isolate audiences and exacerbate this kind of like very divisive discourse. So not looking good in that uh, side. Um, then uh, I think that, I mean, I'm between both of you. I think that, yes, uh, like that information is reaching Russian, Russian audiences, but not enough to make a significant impact. And then finally, on the Telegram, uh, how use, uh, like, like how is it used for spreading Russian disinformation? Oh my God, yes. Um, like uh, it's the main vehicle for, for Russian disinformation in the context of the full scale invasion of Ukraine. But at the same time, it's the main vehicle to expose Russian actions in Ukraine and sometimes debunk Russian disinformation based on the same Russian sources. So it's bad on one side, but actually just like a very valuable resource in the other side. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of, uh, of our time together uh, tonight. Uh, the security of elections, protecting democratic processes from malign interference remains like a topic of, you know, huge importance um, in, in Ukraine and all over the world. And as we said, this will be a very big year for a lot of countries going to the ballot. I think the conversation today has been very, very rich, and I'm sure uh, a lot would have um, found it very useful. And we've identified some really very important lessons. I think we need to kind of continue this conversation and see how will the lessons be applied in other contexts. But I'd like to thank you very much for your time and for such a rich discussion. And please join me in uh, thanking our panelists. Thank you.